I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we do. Those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, good and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like you know grassroots neighborhood organizations a lot of these were sponsored by the church what does it mean to say that the christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there um you're always uh being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects welcome to the magnificast a podcast about christianity and leftist politics i am your co-host once again dean Dutloff. and i'm your deep state CIA operative Maverick. <laughs> That's right. Turn off this podcast right now. Anything that you listen to can be held against you. I don't know how it works. Me um, either. But yeah, yeah, Matt either. That's the CIA for you. <laughs> but here we are, uh, the first episode of the new year. And as you might have guessed, if you uh, are paying attention to the less than a minute of t- things that you've heard. We are going to talk about the CIA. We're going to talk about the government, and uh, you're not going to want to miss it. Um, before we get there, though, Matt, uh, let's do a New Year's check-in. How's it going? How's 2022 going? What are your big New Year's resolutions? Um, man, I don't know. I don't really have any New Year's resolutions. It's such a dark uh, such a dark time to be alive. <laughs> um, so many people are <laughs> sick. They got the COVID. It's awful. Um, as for me, I have... Um, a whole allergy situation going on where my nose is very stuffy and my throat is kind of scratchy, but it's just regular, regular sort of allergy sick, not, uh, not COVID sick. So my big news (laughs) resolution is to get these allergies out of my body, (laughs) cast them (laughs) off and, uh, become a sort of clear breathing person. Uh, what about you? What do you you think you're going to do in this new year? Yeah, nothing so lofty as that. Um, I also had no resolutions for the same reason. You know, my so Emily, my wife, is extremely good at things like resolutions. She makes them, she sticks to them, she accomplishes them, and at the end of the year, she's like, I did it. So she does it so well that this year she was like, last year I had a resolution to do this one thing, and I don't need to carry it over because I've accomplished it. Like, she was able to check it off the list. Um, I am more typical in that I make a resolution maybe on, you know, December 30th and then decide when to give it up by the end of January. This time I said, not for me. I'm not going to have any resolutions. There's no disappointment. And I'm just going to kind of keep riding the general wave of (laughs) of how my life is still bizarre. And we'll see where that takes. That's pretty good. Um, let's see. Oh, for the listeners, Dean and I started playing, uh, Saints Row 4 and, (laughs) Um, we've been playing it kind of on co-op and I guess my, if I did have a New Year's resolution apart from this whole allergy situation, it is to become the most powerful computer man in that game. That's right. To run the fastest, to jump the highest, to glide the farthest. That's really what Matt and I are going to try to accomplish this year. So we've got a lot of, we've got a long road ahead of us on this one. (laughs) Um, yeah, well, cool. Hopefully you and your family or people that you, I don't know, surround yourself with. I don't know, hopefully you had a good New Year. Hopefully you had a good holiday. Um, wishing you the best in this terrible time to be alive. Um, but let's divert our attention away from that awful, that awful, um, the awful sickness, the plague that everyone has. Let's do something different. Let's talk about something exciting. Okay. <laughs> the the awful sickness and plague that the plague. I mean, it's has. it's exciting, but like a you know sort of a boring sort of a tedious life uh, <laughs> kind of way. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, you might have heard things like um, original sin. You might have heard of eschatology. You might have heard of Christology. All of these things, though, they are not dangerous ideas. They are they're really boring ideas, honestly. Listen, if you like theology, that's cool. Good for you. I'm glad. I'm happy for you and your whole situation. But me, theology? No, it's boring. I don't like to read it. 
I don't like to think about it, <laughs> except when I really have to. But what if I... T- Matt's a good evangelical yeah. that way. Just the Bible. Just the that's Bible. It. And that's it. I don't need to... Uh, Thomas Aquinas? No, never heard of him. But what if I told <laughs> you there was a type of theology that was exciting? And not only exciting, but it was dangerous. It's so dangerous that the CIA published several secret papers about it. Well... <laughs> You don't have to imagine this <laughs> this world that I'm setting up here. You don't have to imagine it because it's the world that we do live in. In the 1980s, government think tanks and the CIA both published secret reports on liberation theology that framed it as a threat to the United States hegemony over Latin America and the Caribbean. Pretty cool. According to the CIA, the aspect of such theologies of liberation that we believe most threatening to the third world countries is the activist orientation of its practitioners who urge the oppressed to seek a just life now, not in the hereafter, and use violence to accomplish that goal. So, folks, the CIA, they're afraid of liberation theology, or they were in the 1980s, probably less so now, but that's a whole conversation that we can have in a bit, maybe. So in this episode, we're going to talk through these uh, these two reports that we found. I mean, there's, I think, probably more written about this, but we found two in particular that were quite interesting that explain liberation theology's uh, danger, um, or at least according to the CIA. Um, one of their reports is called A New Inter-American Policy for the 80s, um, which is written by people who would go on to um, be in the Reagan administration. You also might have heard the same – you might have heard this document uh, referred to as the Santa Fe document. Um, and, or maybe you've never heard of it at all, and that's fine too. But it's called the Santa Fe document in a lot of sort of liberation theology circles. Um, and we're also going to talk about a CAA report called Liberation Theology, Religion, Reform, and Revolution, written in 1986. So two great 1980s publications here from <laughs> the bourgeoisie. And um, we're going we're gonna to get into it. Um, so I think all of this stuff is like pretty interesting in and of itself, just as a weird historical footnote when, um, you know, all of these people were afraid of liberation theology. But I think that they actually, I don't know, give us an interesting perspective of liberation theology that maybe we wouldn't have otherwise. I mean, not that like these, not that the CIA is like doing this like great work for us, but I think just kind of like, um, you know, reading these things and thinking through them uh, give you a different perspective on liberation theology. You know, it's not like um, it it gives you a view maybe that liberation theology is not just like um, it's not linked to a specific historical moment or a a socialist project. I mean, it's supportive of those things for sure, but it also is something that's like much larger than just like one socialist movement during the 1980s or something. And I think that's pretty powerful um, when you think about it. So, um, Dean, let's get into it. Tell us about um, the Santa Fe document. I will. Let actually let's do even a little bit more table setting to get people into it. I think okay, what here's my new New Year's resolution for this podcast. I think uh we've done this podcast for so long that I feel like I often just assume everybody kind of knows what we're talking about, but I'm going to uh try to pause and break some things down and not assume that everybody has listened to this podcast for the last several years. Uh, this year and i'm going to start with liberation theology we do talk about it a bunch on the show but you know we're mentioning it now and maybe you're like i still don't really know what it is or i've never encountered it or this is the first time you've listened to this podcast welcome i guess (laughs) if you made it this far liberation theology we should have an idea about it before we maybe dive into like why the caa is concerned about it um so liberation theology in a nutshell is a movement that um in this particular case, in this kind of thing that we're talking about, emerges in Latin America. There's other kinds of liberation theologies, but the CIA in these documents is mostly concerned about Latin America. Uh, It emerges after this big council in the Catholic Church called Vatican II, and in response to all kinds of social movements and things like the Cuban Revolution. So lots of events that happened in the 60s kind of plant the seeds for what becomes liberation theology in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Uh, and and now today too, just like your favorite oldies rock station, I guess. <laughs> um, it's a, a really interesting thing to learn about. There's lots of big names involved that I'm sure we'll kind of mention here and there. But the key is that it's a real revolution in the way that Christians in Latin America, especially, thought about what it meant to be a Christian, especially living in extremely exploited parts of the global South. So the idea is okay if Christianity tells us to care about the poor. Or, you know, uh, if the Catholic Church tells us that we should be kind of going out into the world to meet the world instead of retreating from it, then what does that mean in a situation that where people are, you know, kept poor in systematic ways because of a global economic arrangement of power? 
right? What does it mean to think about all those sort of uh, boring theological themes that Matt talked about earlier, right? Eschatology, Christology, and so on. What does it mean to think about those things when uh, you're surrounded by like people involved in a radical labor movement, let's say, or the peasant movement or something like that? And kind of what's the relationship between theologizing in that context and what theology can offer to that context. So that's what liberation theology is about. And it reaches some big kind of fever pitches throughout Latin America. I think the most famous probably is the Sandinista revolution in Nicaragua, where uh, it, by the end of it, when the revolutionaries won, there were four priests in the government and a whole mess of Christians in the government as well. So that's like the maybe the highest point, right, where liberation theology actually sort of ends up being a, a major successful piece of the revolutionary movement. Okay, I don't know. Anything else we should add about that before we dive into the Santa Fe document? No, I think that's pretty good. A pretty good introduction. I mean, there's so many moving parts. Um, go back, listen yeah. to our other episodes about liberation theology or go read a book or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Or listen to uh, David and oh, yeah. one of our favorite Jesuits. Uh, he has a podcast called the Liberation Theology Podcast and is very cool and good. And you should check it out. Um, OK, so the Santa Fe document, like Matt said as well, is something that is referred to a lot in liberation theology circles. It becomes sort of a notorious document. In fact, I was watching a like subtitled video with uh, Fry Beto, a Brazilian priest recently um, talking about liberation theology. And he mentioned the Santa Fe document just like in a video on YouTube the, like last year. So they're still out there talking about it. <laughs> it's still like important. And subscribe for your boy. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, like and subscribe, smash that button. Um, so the Santa Fe document uh, is really interesting because there's actually not a ton of stuff about liberation theology in it, but what is in it and the way that it's contextualized is actually very important. So let me set up the document and then we can talk through it a little bit. So Penny Lerno. She's a U.S. journalist who moved to Latin America and did a lot of interesting reporting on liberation theology. She wrote this really fascinating book called People of God. Uh, if you ever want to read a good journalistic take about some of these events in Latin America, that is a good place to start for sure. Not without its problems, but it's a great book. And she has a nice little um, intro to it saying that the document was written in 1980 by Reagan's advisors on Latin America uh, side note, I guess Reagan hadn't been like elected yet, but they would go on to be his advisors, including Roger Fontaine, who became his Central America advisor on the National Security Council and Louis Tams, who served as U.S. ambassador to Costa Rica until he was forced to resign because of his involvement in the Iran Contra scandal. Uh, whoops is right. Uh, popularly known as the Santa Fe document for the city in which it was written. A new inter-American policy served as a charter for the Reagan administration's Latin American policies. So to set it up here, this is the document that you can find on the Internet. Um, it is called a new inter-American policy for the 80s. Uh, in particular, you know, it, it outlines what it sounds like, I guess. It's, it's a white paper about how the U.S. should relate to uh, Latin America, especially, but also Canada. And, uh, you know, there's lots to say about it. It's all very concerned about uh, the Soviet Union and, and Cuba and all these other places and the, the Sandinistas and Nicaragua. And uh, the, the paper sort of like puts forward a vision for like how, you know, theoretically at this stage, a new president would kind of deal with this. Like what would be the policy decisions they could make in order to contain communism and, uh, and promote U.S. interests in the inter-American sort of region of the world. So Matt, I'm going to read the one proposal that has to deal with liberation theology, and then maybe we can unpack that proposal and talk about it more in context. Yeah. Uh, so in the white paper, there's all these proposals um, organized under different headings. Here is proposal three. U.S. foreign policy must begin to counter, not react against, liberation theology as it is utilized in Latin America by the liberation theology clergy. The role of the church in Latin America is vital to the concept of political freedom. Unfortunately, Marxist Leninist forces have utilized the church as a political weapon against private property and productive capitalism by infiltrating the religious community with ideas that are less Christian, less Christian than communist. Uh, so there you have it. That's the proposal. U.S. foreign policy should intentionally counter liberation theology for these reasons. 
uh, really wild sort of proposal, you know, uh, snuck in underneath lots of other proposals. Yeah, you know, I mean, this whole the whole uh, Santa Fe document is full of these kinds of like, <laughs> I, I mean, kind of magical thinking proposals where it's just like, here's something that we should probably do or figure out. And they're usually kind of bonkers and sort of high level thinking. Like there's one in there about like the AFL-CAO and using that to sort of like create a labor movement in Latin America that would be like friendly to capitalism, which is interesting. Um, but like, I don't know, uh, the U S foreign, U S foreign policy should counter, uh, liberation theology, how, who knows, but they should do it for sure. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the frightening thing is, uh, this is the, the general framework, but the Reagan administration did try to fill that in, in lots of, uh, lots of experimental ways, most of which involved, you know, funding guerrilla movements and, uh, right wing terrorist governments and so on across the region. So that is what is so wild. It's yeah. like there is this kind of magical thinking to it. And what's frightening is like, they right. it gets worked it. out yeah, <laughs> like they totally. figured it out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, there's a bunch of other proposals that get worked out too, in some really fascinating ways. Um, but yeah, this one definitely um, in the form of uh, yeah. Uh, death squads and whatnot. Pretty awful. Um, but yeah, I mean, an interesting, an interesting piece of, I don't know, a weird artifact from like what seems like another world. Um, but, uh, good for the Marxist Leninists who've decided that the church was, <laughs> the church was the political weapon they needed and uh, good job, that good job. I don't know. It's, uh, it's funny though, that like, um, in this conceptualization, it is the Marxist Leninists who are the ones doing it and not like clergy or not, you know, not liberation mm-hmm. theologians, not people who are like, you know, just invested in like the, in reading the Bible, it's not Christians behind it. It's like Marxist Leninists who are uh, subverting the whole thing. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, so this this proposal is sandwiched between all kinds of stuff where the the specter of communism, the fear of communism is the driving force in the whole document. And it's interesting how that kind of ideological fear actually forces the U.S. government to totally fail to understand things like liberation theology um, this actually changes a little bit when we look at the other CIA document that we'll talk about, which is from uh, later in the 80s and the yeah. mid 80s. But at this stage, like the, uh, you know, the assumption that Marxists have infiltrated the church, as they put it, and, uh, you know, this kind of like, I don't know if they're sort of unwitting clergy have gone along with it or something like that, or they say these are ideas that are less Christian than communist, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the assumption here is that liberation theology is just a, a vehicle to be kind of exploited or... Uh, the Marxists have duped a whole continent's worth of of Christians, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, nowhere is there this kind of um, careful assumption or careful kind of work around, you know, why does liberation theology emerge? And this is written in 1980, which kind of in the history of liberation theology, like the published record of stuff. So by that, I mean, like theologians formally writing about liberation theology that stuff is already coming into English in like the early, early seventies. And, uh, by the time you get to 1980, like there are just like, you know, mountains and mountains of translated books in English on liberation theology. So it's like a complete failure to do yeah. any thinking at all <laughs> about it, but you can see how it, uh, fits a political. Purpose. Yeah. Well, not only does the specter of communism sort of make them, uh, <laughs> fail to understand like what liberation theology is about it also um it also helps them uh helps them fail to understand capitalism as well i mean throughout this entire document the assumption is that capitalism is all about production and like efficient production i guess is the the vibe you get in marxism not so much marxism is about distribution capitalism is about production and like Mm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I don't think so, bud. <laughs> oh, uh, capitalism, the uh, yeah. political economy that throws like thousands and thousands of tons of food away every year just because they can't sell it. That one, that's the productive efficiency you're talking about. And no, I don't think so. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, I don't know. This is something that is probably a tale as old as time. But boy, is it true in the United States, you know, people who become who kind of style themselves as like policy wonks or experts or whatever. Um, They reach these positions of genuine power, but they do not do so by virtue of doing their homework or understanding a topic inside and out. Right. They do so by, you know, pushing an ideological line and like, I don't know, whatever. That's that's true on the right and left, I'm sure. But uh, it's so fascinating to read a document like this, like uh, not only on liberation theology, but like you're saying Matt, they do have a line where they they contrast capitalism and Marxism that way, saying capitalism is about productive work and Latin America needs production and therefore they need capitalism. 
as opposed to Marxism, which they say is not productive, not about production, but about distribution, which is like, uh, you know, it, also a complete failure to understand yeah. Marxism. Like you can disagree with Marxism for sure. That's fine. Uh, but like <laughs> to say that it's not about production is like, OK, <laughs> I don't know where you read in Marx that there's nothing going on about production there. But uh, I'd love to love to <laughs> Marx, find out. the guy that wants to, to tell you all about coats and how to make them. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, he only wants to talk about where to put them, <laughs> who to give them to, uh, what warehouses to place them in. Of course. Well, all right, Dean. Um, like we said, this is uh, the Santa Fe document has a lot of weird anti-communist stuff in it um, and a lot of misunderstandings of liberation. Well, one misunderstanding of liberation theology and a lot of misunderstandings of capitalism. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I don't know. What should we take away from it? Uh, having having stumbled upon it. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot to say about it. I mean, I first sort of heard of it by reading liberation theologians themselves who will often mention it. Like if you read. I don't know, a lot of liberation theology books published after like the 90s, especially when all this stuff became more public knowledge. You'll see it referred to the Santa Fe document over and over and over again. Um, and I, you know, I got intrigued and I think I was actually surprised to find that there's only really one yeah, paragraph about liberation too. theology in it. Yeah, I think I expected like some really beefy report or something. But what is significant is all all of these people point to it as a moment when the U.S. government you know, sort of prepares to target liberation theology mm -hmm. intentionally. And that actually matters a lot. Like, uh, it's one thing to be like, yeah, the U.S. government has anti-communist agendas and therefore, you know, it runs ar around the world ruining people's lives with that kind of ideological thing going on and liberation theologians get caught in the crossfire. But like, uh, having a policy proposal specifically nestled in with all these other proposals about things like the AFL-CIO or wh whomever else, um, it is really unique. And I think uh, it, the two things that I take away from it anyway, one is that it shows that the U.S. government had a, a vested interest in combating liberation yeah. theology in a proactive way, right? That That matters. And secondly, it shows maybe on the more positive side that liberation theology was a force so significant that the U.S. government recognized, like, we are we, we have to deal with this as a thing. Like, it's not a negligible thing. I think that's huge for people on the left who like to kind of dismiss liberation theology as like a weird curiosity or a kind of cultural matter. But um, here I do think the the proof that you have, I guess, is that liberation theology is a an anti-imperialist force strong enough to kind of get the attention of the imperialists. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Well, let's move on a little bit here and talk about the second, um, the second uh, essay article report. I don't know. I think it's a report <laughs> from the CIA. So the Santa Fe document written in 1980 in 1986, the, um, the analysis and the language and a lot of like the sort of background information is obviously like, um, you know, expanded upon in a more mature way than just like liberation theology is a bunch of Marxist Leninists pretending to go to church or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's different. Um, it's a lot more mature. It's a lot more in depth. It's still wrong in some ways and very strange in others. But anyways, it's pretty, pretty fascinating. So anyways, the report is called the, uh, the report is called liberation theology, religion, reform and revolution. Um, it the the version that we have is like a it's you know like a, a sanitized version that the CAA eventually released. Um, it's kind of full of redactions and therefore some of it reads kind of strangely and incomplete. Um, wherever there's a redacted spot, I imagine it's just a part where the CAA is talking about murdering priests or something. I don't know, um, <laughs> right. but yeah, a lot going on there. So I'll, I'll read the. Um, there's a, there's a, a handy little piece at the very very beginning that explains the scope of the um, of the report. So I'll read that first, then we can kind of go from there. The Directorate of Intelligence sponsored a conference on liberation theology and communism in the fall of 1985 to explore the connection between liberation theology and the growth of political instability in the third world. Of particular concern is the deliberate use of liberation theology by Marxist-Leninist groups to promote revolutionary change. This paper draws on the presentations made at that conference on discussions with regional specialists to examine the phenomenon of liberation theology and the popular church, as well as to assess its implications for the United States. So there, from the very beginning, you get an idea of what, what the article is about. Um, the CIA, they want to know more about liberation theology and what's going on there. Um from that very that very top level, it's just like, you know, they're kind of exploring this idea. They want to see what it's about. Um, they want to learn more about it and, and how it might um, 
cause problems in quote unquote third world countries. But the language changes once you kind of start getting into the article itself. Um, not only is, you know, it, it's not that liberation theology is something that they are kind of worried about or something, but liberation theology is described by the CAA as a dangerous idea. It's something that, um, uh, that they think is going to cause some serious problems um, uh, given sort of like the political landscape of, of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean in the 1980s. Yeah, it is really interesting to kind of compare this with the Santa Fe document. So if you see the Santa Fe document as planting some seeds, maybe this is them, you know, having been watered and come to fruition, I guess. Um, it is interesting, too, because the Santa Fe document is a, a wish list from some policy wonks who end up being in power, whereas this is a, uh, you know, a, a document prepared by and for the CIA, right? Uh, a document that um, is sort of uh, part of the, the government machine as it's turning along. And I think there's a lot to say about it. It's like 30 pages or something. And I think it's worth reading for a lot of reasons. It's it's very revealing. Um, you know, the the super interesting part about it is it does end up developing a more... I don't know. I don't want to use the word nuanced because it's not nuanced. No. <laughs> a more a more complicated perspective yeah. maybe on liberation theology. Um but uh what's really fascinating too about it, I was surprised to find there are a number of uh kind of like individuals who are mentioned in the report that um like I uh had only read in passing like glancing stuff here and there over the years in liberation theology and I was like whoa that is surprising to see this particular priest named here or like uh they do really kind of track um uh not only liberation theology but it's kind of adjacent movements in other places like South Korea or South Africa um there's this kind of uh, awareness that this is an international uh phenomenon of of radical Christians doing stuff um, so there's a lot to kind of maybe unpack there, too. And, you know, anytime you read a CAA document, especially about left wing people's movements, you always have to take them with a grain of salt. But, um, yeah, like I said, I, I was surprised at um, how much material actually made it in to this report in a way that I was like, ah, oh, someone did read a bunch of Orbis mm -hmm. books, I guess. Yeah. To me, what makes it interesting is that, you know, it's not um, it's about liberation theology in a weird sociological sense. I mean, in a political sense, too. Right. Yeah. It's like it's not asking what liberation theology believes or whatever. That's kind of not the point. The point of the CIA article is to explain, like where liberation theology might creep up and like why. And that's sort of fascinating to see, you know, someone from the CAA to think that through or whatever. <laughs> and uh, kind of, I mean, pretty, mm -hmm. pretty scary, I guess, too, in some ways. But um, yeah, I don't know. Let's just here. I'll, I'll give you an example. How about that? So the CIA writes, we don't know the author's name, by the way. So it's just the CIA always redacted. redacted. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. They write. We believe that liberation theology and other radical variants of the movement as found in South Africa and South Korea can flourish where repressive regimes have blocked progress towards political and social reform, and the church provides one of the few places in the community for the disaffected to gather. The movement is also more likely to be influential in countries with charismatic religious leaders and a history of church involvement in politics. So from the very beginning here, that's I mean, that's kind of what I'm I'm after or that's what I'm that's what I'm talking about. It's not about the sort of theology as such, but it's about like w where and why it happens. And I think it's actually a, a pretty interesting, um, a pretty interesting explanation for why it happens. I mean, it, it, I think it makes sense. It's probably it's probably true. Right. Um, but there you go. The CIA. That's the, that's the level, I guess, that we're working at uh, in this document. Uh, the CIA is trying to kind of figure out exactly like what makes the liberation theology like as a movement sort of tick right and the key is uh you know understanding it in order to advance u.s interests yeah. right which they say even in the summary actually hang on i'll find it here yeah uh while liberation theology has served to promote u.s interests by assisting popular efforts to bring democratic reform to authoritarian states they do not list what yeah. those are by the way uh, it also has posed a major threat to U.S. interests by providing a fertile ground for communist exploitation. In Central America and the Philippines in particular, we judge that the collaboration of some nuns, missionaries, and members of the clergy with the Marxist revolutionaries has given and will continue to lend legitimacy to guerrilla movements while hampering government efforts to contain them. 
Um, I think this is a paragraph that is very striking in what it does and does not yeah. say uh, and tells you a lot about the CIA and liberation theology both, right? So uh, uh, the point of understanding liberation theology is to see where it uh, conflicts with U.S. interests. But what those interests are are like so, um, you know, slippery and sneaky, like uh, bringing democratic reform to authoritarian states. So let's just think of some examples where that might be, right? We might think of, for instance, Nicaragua, which comes up a lot in this particular thing. So uh, Somoza, for example, is one person who uh, comes to mind, right? A person who is like literally selling the uh, the blood of Nicaraguan peasants to blood banks in the United States, um, an authoritarian leader for sure, but one who definitely serves the interest of the U.S., uh, an authoritarian leader who serves the interests of the U.S. Um, you might think of like, I don't know, Brazil, which had a military dictatorship that was also very friendly to the United States or El Salvador or <laughs> any other country in Latin America that had a right wing authoritarian government. All these governments were right wing and authoritarian basically for the sake of U.S. interests. Right. So. I don't know, the, like the way that U.S. capitalism operated in the 20th century was basically to secure extremely cheap goods and labor in places like Latin America and uh, ensure that those um, kind of supply chains and supply lines didn't get disrupted, which uh, in those countries, having a right wing ruler that they can rely on is not something they usually complained about. Right. So like for the report here to say, ah, liberation theology has promoted U.S. interests by um, dissolving these right wing right. leaders <laughs> is like not true yeah. they like they don't believe that but they have to say like freedom is good and so therefore you, they kind of run into this really mm -hmm. weird problem yeah um that happens a few times in this article where the uh the authors propose that like may, like okay liberation theology it could be bad if it sort of leaves things open if it leaves the door open for communists or whatever but it could be good too we're not going to rule that out <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but like do you think of an, ex uh, an example no you couldn't it's <laughs> it's pretty bizarre um Okay, well, that's that's a good kind of um, pin to stick in it, and uh, we'll kind of keep that that thought with us as we kind of move move through it here. Um, there, like I said a minute ago, though, though there's a lot of observations in this uh, article in this uh, report about like what makes liberation theology happen as like a movement, and um, <laughs> there's uh, some kind of like long winded explanations of of what it is exactly, but there is a um, <laughs> there's like this like sort of like weird section like if it's like a textbook that's like key questions for assessing where liberation theology could become politically <laughs> significant. So these are the questions you need to be asking <laughs> if you're like an operative in the field or whatever <laughs> about liberation theology, about the possible prob problematic liberation theologians or uh, or people's movements. So um, first, you need to think about the background factors of uh, a given situation. Is the percentage of Christians that uh, you're thinking about here, especially Catholic in the total population? <laughs> so if they are, <laughs> they might be liberation theologians. Um, OK, does the church have a history of involvement in politics? If so, you might you might have a people's movement. I feel like I'm Jeff Foxworthy. <laughs> I yeah. love this Jeff Foxworthy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, does the presence of extreme poverty, human rights violations and trade dependency suggest blockages in the political system inhibiting reform? Oh, my God. <laughs> Hard not to be very cynical reading this, but uh, it's probably yeah. for the best. Is there an active insurgency or a high degree of civil unrest? So those are the uh, the four key questions about background factors. So if, if those things are true, you might have a whole liberation theology situation on your hands that you need to figure out. Uh, but it goes on. Um, there are also some tactical indicators, some some great CIA language. Um, here are some more questions you can ask yourself about a given situation. Does the church provide the primary locus for organizing and expressing discontent with the regime? That's actually a really interesting observation um, about sort of like the yeah. centrality of churches in in you know places where liberation theology becomes uh, prevalent or powerful or traditional or something. Um, you know, the church is it, it happens there because that's where people can gather and sort of like the language they can use to express the situation. I, I mean, uh, CA sucks, but I mean, I guess that's right. Um, they go on to say, do proponents emphasize the revolutionary mission of the church through propaganda and public statements? Um, okay. Do they share an anti-capitalist, anti-West orientation? Do proponents advocate the use of violence to promote change? So there you go. Um, if if all of these things are true, 
you better watch out because the CIA is going to come and be awful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, what's wild, though, is like they're not uh, I mean, like, I think they're they're right. Like these actually are yeah. like, pretty good key questions for assessing where liberation theology could become politically significant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, um, do you have a lot of Catholics around? Uh, are they all hanging out at churches? Is the church the place where they get upset at the government? Like these are all. You know, like uh, I've taught a class on liberation theology a few times, and um, I don't know, this isn't like too far off from the kind of, you know, ad hoc criteria that I've suggested before that you could, you know, if you wanted to sort of think through where liberation theology could emerge in, in a different context, these are kind of the indicators that you would actually find looking through the 20th century. This is what happened. So, I mean, it, it's very interesting for that reason. Uh, like like I said earlier, someone has decided to like do their homework and figure it out. Uh, there are some also slights of hand. I don't want to like say too much about it. You know, like do proponents advocate the use of violence, yeah, for example? That's a pretty complicated um, thing. There actually. are like, yeah, exactly. Like, there are some liberation theologians who do. There are others who are a lot more reserved about that or or wouldn't properly be described as advocating the use of violence. Um, there are some liberation theologians who, like, defend the use of violence but don't necessarily advocate right. for it, which is a pretty important distinction. But, you know, whatever. This is a bullet-pointed list in a CIA document, <laughs> so I'm not expecting that level of, of nuance. But uh, it's, it's interesting, nevertheless, to just kind of, you know, try to pay attention to those little cues. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, um, the thing, I mean, the the mistake that this document does make is that like liberation theology is sort of monolithic in, you know, in itself. I mean, I guess like, um, what liberation theology is or what liberation theologians believe is probably beyond the scope of like what they really care about. But those things do end up mattering in pretty important ways for the movements that they, they are part of. Right. Like, I don't know, Ernesto Cardinal, (laughs) <laughs> is like a, a particular type of liberation theology who has a a particular approach to violence that you know ends up working working its way out in in a in a way that uh, is different than others or something. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I, you know, like I like I said, I am pretty impressed that the report does identify some nuances that you wouldn't guess. For instance, when they're talking about um, like the origins of liberation theology in a theoretical way, they note that. It actually has a lot of roots in European traditions around liberalism, social democracy, and Marxism. And that is true, and actually something that a lot of people who read liberation theology don't sort of attend to. And it's actually a really interesting point, because when you read liberation theology, you see the tensions of all those things trying to kind of find a home in the same text. Like, um, I'm reading uh, Jose uh, Porfirio Miranda right now, and you see those tensions a lot in his work, especially because he's maybe like he's very, very interested in Marxism specifically, but he is not like a uh, he's not a scientific Marxist by any stretch either. You can tell there's kind of a liberal humanist bent to him that is very important. And, uh, you know, so all that to say, like, if you if you know that those are sort of the theoretical genealogies going into it, you can kind of maybe find some things in liberation theology texts that you might not see on like a first reading. So like I said, like finding those little nuances is, is pretty surprising, but uh, yeah, what a, what an extremely weird (laughs) document for people to totally. I mean, and it even goes as far to explain like how in, in Africa liberation theology looks different because it puts, you know, more of an emphasis on black nationalism or whatever. And like, right. You know, it does get a little bit more granular than you'd expect uh, from, from people from from the CIA, but um, yeah, uh, it's interesting. Well, let's let's turn towards the end of this uh, CIA document, and then we can talk about some more of the big picture stuff. Um, okay, yeah. So the article ends with some like um, uh, some some like forecasting towards the future, like what might liberation theology mean for the future. Um, you know, it's it talked a little bit about history. It's talked a little bit about the way it acts, but like what, you know, like what can we expect from liberation theology? Um, and it says this liberation theology can pose a serious threat to us interests when it's critique of capitalism and U S development policy finds a receptive audience. And more important, when the movement's inability to articulate a political economic model for, re- for restructuring society provides an opening for communist exploitation, <laughs> <laughs> That's a very bizarre way to put it. But I mean, the idea is that liberation theology is a problem when it doesn't have a um, <laughs> it doesn't have a uh, 
political economic model that is nice to the United States in mind. And it lets it lets right. communists sneak in and say, surprise, socialism. I don't I don't know of right. any. I mean, I don't know who what liberation theology is like that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> anyways, it goes on to say we believe Moscow's recent experience with the Polish prelature has increased its awareness of the symbolic importance of the Catholic Church and how it can be used to support secular political reform. We also believe the division between the two churches in Latin America, a people's church with strong socialist precepts and an official church with allegiance to the Vatican, may present a tactical opportunity for the Soviets to form a united front against the host government. So there's a little bit of some conspiratorial thinking in this um, that I think is worth noting. Like, okay... Liberation theology is diverse. It's, there's a lot of different things going on within liberation the, theology, especially, I mean, depending on the theologian, depending on the time, the place, all of these things, right? But it is like, it is kind of weird to think that like, well, the real problem is when it doesn't, it doesn't assert its own political economic model strong enough that, it, you know, <laughs> that it, <laughs> right. it's weird that uh, that's sort of like the problem. I mean, I don't know that liberation theologians are like mostly socialists. I don't know. I can't think of really one who's not. I mean, some people formulate that differently and they like talk about it in yeah, I mean more or less reserved ways, but like it's pretty clear. I don't know. Um, but uh an interesting and kind of bizarre way of thinking about um the conspiracy that is liberation theology. Yeah, for sure. It's interesting too because I think a lot of liberation theologians what they do um you know, as a practice is like they are not creating a blueprint for a society. They are doing theological reflection on the situations in which they find yeah. themselves. And what happens is, you know, they don't have an economic model to express or kind of impose because the whole point is like they're trying to do theology with the people who are, you know, inventing economic models of of alternative <laughs> kind of ways of being together. Right. So like, uh, the one, like the few times that you do get something a little stronger, I guess, is when you'll have somebody like Fry Beto, who I mentioned earlier, goes to Cuba or even Ernesto Cardinal goes to Cuba and they both kind of have these, uh, transformative moments where they realize, oh, this is actually the kind of material expression of what I've been trying to think about theologically. Right. And, you know, they take that back to their countries in, in different ways. But uh, it, it's like <laughs> all liberation theologians are basically like, we're just trying to figure out what it means to build a society for the poor. And like, surprise, it doesn't end up cashing out as capitalism. <laughs> like they're they're honest people who think very hard about the world. And if you do that, it's going to be hard to end up being a capitalist who cares about, you know, the cry of the poor. It's true. <laughs> exactly. I mean, the, the 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 conspiracy of liberation theology is not much of a conspiracy. It's all pretty straightforward from my perspective. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, <laughs> think that they could have uh they could have spent uh less time on that but that's okay um yeah the we could say too the uh the soviet stuff in here is interesting mm -hmm. right like uh the soviet union did take an interest in liberation theology but it is not clear at least i've never found anybody say it in a way that i found satisfactory it's not clear exactly how much interest that really was like there's like, I don't know, you could find, you know, the odd article in like Pravda or something probably about like liberation theology, but that doesn't tell you that much. Or uh, it's true. It is definitely true that like the KGB had some interests in liberation theology. It's also true that liberation theologians had done tours of the Soviet Union and things like that. That is all accurate. But like if you actually go into the text and read the the texts of liberation theologians, I, I'm thinking of even kind of the highest profile ones, right? Like Leonardo Boff, let's say. Um, you find certainly an openness to the, the Leninist tradition, let's say. Like, you know, Boff might quote someone like Lenin or Marx here and there. But what you don't find is an uncritical support of yeah. the Soviet Union. In fact, you often find them going out of their yep. way to say, look, I'm not saying where we want the Soviet Union in Brazil, but I am saying, you know, we don't want <laughs> U.S. anti-communism in Brazil. Right. So uh, it's interesting too to just kind of see the CIA, you know, not without good reason, I guess, being concerned about the Soviet Union's influence or interest in liberation theology. But uh, I think just like the Santa Fe document, it sort of, uh, you know, it presumes that liberation theologians are like too naive and stupid to like have, I don't know, the intelligence to sort out what, what's in their own interest. Yeah, or I think not. that's right. Um, well, OK, we can draw a lot of interesting conclusions maybe from this or we can learn a lot of things. We probably mentioned a lot of them already. But um, 
as I was reading through these documents, I was really struck by, I mean, just the CIA's treatment of like liberation theology as a thing in and of itself, rather than sort of like a subgenre of like religious socialism, I thought was really fascinating. Like uh, mm-hmm. the CIA, I mean, for better and for worse, I mean, for worse, almost exclusively they you know they think of liberation theology as a thing that exists that's not um that's not reducible to like socialist movements in latin america and in the caribbean and i think that's actually kind of a good idea (laughs) i mean screw the cia like whatever but uh but liberation theology being something that's like um not that that is i mean okay it is tied to a, a geography it's tied to a place that's true but it is uh, it is a type of theology that does like lend itself to a bigger project that like you know kind of goes beyond the scope of the the historical moment that it's in. I think liberation theology is a a really meaningful way of thinking about the world um, politically and you know religiously that that goes beyond just like the socialist movements of like the 1980s. Yeah, definitely. And it's, uh, you know, they're they're rightly keying in on the international yeah. character of the movement, which is true and something that I think people forget about today. Like uh, we've never done an episode on this, but one day we need to um, the uh, eat what E-A-T-W-O-T right. is a big acronym for it's like, I don't know, ecum- what is it? Ecumenical Association of Third World Theology or Theologians, something like that. Anyway, uh, it was it it started in the late seventies, but it was a a place for liberation theologians, but other theologians as well, to come together and just talk about third world liberation in a liberationist theological perspective. But you know, lots of diversity and so on, and uh, you know that's really important to track and really important to remember as we kind of retell the story of liberation theology and. Yeah, like you said, the CIA, for tactical reasons, I guess, understands that that's true. Um, so we should do. <laughs> we should understand it in a different context. Yeah, in a that's different right. Way. You know, something else that I am just now thinking about and maybe is a bad idea. I don't know. Who knows? I don't know if it's a bad idea until I say it out loud, I guess. But um, yeah, please <laughs> I'll tell you. Well, I mean, I, I think like um, something that's interesting that's kind of revealed i think in the cia report in in as it as it sort of takes apart the nuts and bolts of like what makes a people's movement based on liberation theology i mean it reveals that like um the united states does not have the capacity for this type of movement <laughs> um mm-hmm. I, I think just for for no other reason than just like the sort of lack of centrality of the church um not 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 in the sense of like oh, why are why are millennials leaving the church but in the sense of like you know, there's not a common shared space where people go <laughs> together, and that's and if there yeah. is, that that space is not a religious one. Um, so it makes it makes liberation theology like as a as an as like a people's movement a really hard idea for North America. I mean, with some with some exceptions, obviously, where things have happened. I mean, you know, for sure. But uh, in in 2021, I'm sorry. Oh my God! In 2022, uh, the year of our Lord, uh, it's like it's not uh, it's not a it's not the same kind of threat. <laughs> and and you know, people get yeah. pe- people now in the United States get very excited about it, and like they should because the ideas within liberation theology are really good, and I think it paints a uh, picture of a world that is better than the one that we have for sure. Um, and it also gives you a way to connect to other you know people struggling in the world. But also, it's just like you kind of have to recognize the. The, the limited power that liberation theology might have as a mobilizing force in the United States. And I guess that's kind of a bummer. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I used to ask the students I had in my class at the end of it, you know, what would it mean? It, it Could you have liberation theology in the U.S.? And like, if you did, what would it mean to have it? What would what would have to change and all that kind of stuff? And I always loved that conversation because uh people inevitably ask really good questions like how would you how would you have a base community at your yeah. church right like you can get a bunch of people to come to a bible study or whatever but can you like also do mutual aid there and can you also use that as a place to talk about how to unionize your workplace and stuff like that and like you know there are some exceptions of that happening in the US and of course we do have major ecclesial political mo- moments whatever the mm-hmm. civil rights movement and so on and so forth um, so not trying to say it doesn't happen, but like it, that, that sociological, um, decentralization, as you call them, Matt, I think is, is true, right? There's, there's not, um, uh, like in even countries where liberation theology was super significant, uh, 
uh, like Chile, let's say, uh, you had a, a super divided bishops conference when it came to the election, uh, when they elected Salvador Allende in, in 1970, right? Like major, major divisions among the hierarchy. So the, the centralized part of the church, but the sort of phenomenological experience, the sociological experience of being a Catholic person in Chile and the experience of having tons of like foreign priests and missionaries and stuff running around in Chile, all that stuff kind of comes together to be able to create extremely weird movements that are popular, right? Like people go to church because like, that's part of what it means to be a regular yeah. person in, in that society. And so you inevitably rub elbows with these other people who also go to church and happen to know something about socialism. And that's not really, I've never had that experience myself being a socialist Christian person, except for like eventually kind of finding your people as an adult, <laughs> right, you know, that right. kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, so there you go. That's what you can learn from the CIA. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, one thing that I do really like about it though, is, uh, I, I do think, like you said too, there's a bit of a vogue in people reading about liberation theology. And I think it's great. Like I, I think it's really encouraging and very cool. Uh, the concern I sometimes have around it though, is, um, when we say liberation theology, people sometimes mean that is just like anything that sounds kind of radical or like gets you, I don't know, like in trouble with like a handful of people on the internet or like would get you in trouble with your pastor. And it's important to recognize that like liberation theology, especially in the Latin American context is a movement that was so significant that literally the federal government was like, we have to do something about this. <laughs> like it's a big problem and we don't know how to handle right. it. And like, you know, like reading liberation theology is one thing actually trying to sort of think about what would that mean for your life and what would be the challenge that it poses to your life as a person living in the imperial core is like a completely different like magnitude mm -hmm. of question and i think it's important as we kind of go through that vogue of people discovering this really great tradition to you know always be emphasizing like okay it has material demands and consequences and that's actually way more important than like i don't know whatever it makes you think about with the trinity i mean do yeah. that for sure i guess like <laughs> no problem, but like, yeah, do the rest. Yeah, of I mean, too. that's a good point, though, right? Like, um, you can read liberation theology, and that's fine. No one, the CIA, they're not going to get mad at you for reading a book. I mean, maybe they would. I don't know. I don't know the CIA personally, <laughs> but um, maybe they would. But you know, like, what will get you in trouble is like when you start organizing based on those ideas. <laughs> that will get you in trouble, right? But um, you know, when people read liberation theology in the United States, that's they're doing they're doing the reading, but but maybe not the organizing, which you know is a whole other story. Yeah, yeah. And and exactly. It's like, how do we translate the the lessons of organizing in liberation theology to a U.S. context? Like, it's never going to be a one to one correlation. Um, liberation theology today, even in Latin America, looks different, way different than it looked three decades ago, even two decades ago, you know, so like it's always going to take some interpretive work and it's going to take a lot of work to be like, well, it wouldn't make sense for me to have a base community in the way they did in like the favelas of Sao Paulo <laughs> or something, but like, you know, maybe I could whatever do whatever Ryan Cagle is doing out there in Alabama or something, you know, like that kind of stuff um, is maybe a, a kind of in the spirit of liberation theology, I guess in the spirit of doing theology so intensely that like somebody has to do homework at the CIA <laughs> to figure you out. Well, that's as good as you can hope for. I think in this life um, doing theology <laughs> so good, you make the government mad. That's cool. Yeah, you waste their time. Taxpayer dollars. I'm trying to read the seven seven trillion dollar budget is going to at least part of it goes towards figuring whatever you're doing out is cool. That's great. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, there is a ton of other history on this. I wish there was like one good big book. Maybe one day we'll get around to writing it or finding someone else to write it. One big book on like how the U.S. government has treated liberation theology, but um, I encourage you to go look up some more stuff. I, uh, I don't know. This is kind of like an appendix, I guess, to the episode. But one fun uh, quote I remembered um, or passage I remembered is from uh, Damning the Flood, Haiti, Aristide and the Politics of Containment. And I mentioned it because it kind of takes us like beyond the 80s stuff we were just looking at. Um, I'll read a little paragraph here, I guess, and people can decide if they want to learn more. Um, but here uh, they say U.S. Army intelligence officers understood exactly what was at stake. Uh, 
and all through the 80s and early 90s recognized the most serious threat to U.S. interests was not secular Marxist-Leninism or organized labor, but liberation theology. Nowhere did the counterinsurgency measures that the U.S. and its allies devised in order to deal with liberation theology in the 80s and 90s fall more heavily than they did on the Haiti of Lavalis and the Tilleglis, which is like a popular movement. It's no coincidence that the most notorious assassin hired to terror- terrorize Lavalis from 1990 to 1994, Toto Constant, who's still alive, by the way, first began working for the CIA on a course designed to explain and contain the extreme left-wing implications of the theology of liberation, which Constant understood as an attempt to, quote, convince the people that in the name of God everything is possible, and therefore it was right for the people to kill soldiers and the rich. And anyway, that guy ended up killing tons and tons of poor people. Uh, So I mentioned that as one example that kind of takes us out of the Reagan administration into the Clinton years. Um, You can find out, I think, even more history on how the U.S. is still meddling in liberation theology projects, right? Like, uh, you know, experiments in Bolivia or Venezuela or Ecuador or uh, Paraguay, which had a Catholic bishop as a president for a minute, Brazil, and so on. So I think, uh, I guess the reason I wanted to tack this on at the end is to say that the story we're telling is is a, definitely a Reagan years kind of story with these documents. But like, you know, Joe Biden, our Catholic president, is probably still very concerned about liberation theology. And I think it's important that we kind of keep on telling that story as well. Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. If you like what you heard, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Magnificast. Uh, If you support us there, you get all kinds of neat things like a sticker or an invite to our Discord community and sometimes even uh, an extra podcast we do behind the paywall called The Lock-In where we have a fictional youth group and we answer questions and do current events and it's great. All right, you should do that or just leave us an iTunes review. That's fine too. Whatever you want. Our intro music is by Mari Armstrong and our outro music is by The Illogical Spoon. We'll see you next week. Get up at church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord. Jackson, keep your hoods up. Keep your hoods up and you stay up late in Jackson. You keep your hoods up, well you keep your hoods up and you stay up late. Oh, don't mind a cold night, but we might mind if you leave too soon. So come on now, it's still early. Peace out, whatever.